Hello everyone and welcome. The gaming industry potentially holds important business lessons for many other kinds of industries or product areas. And in fact, gaming has been the lead in driving platforms like home computing, VR, mobile applications, and innovative consumer business models like free to play. So today we are joined by Ludovic Bowden, who has basically a 20 year experience in tech and gaming globally. He was early in social games and free-to-play games with the largest Unity games on browser and Facebook, a social shooter called Uberstrike. I remember those games very fondly, Ludovic. You then shifted to investment around four years ago, and you've already had a couple of unicorns, I believe, in your investment portfolio. And aside from other things, I think you are most recently the author of Atomic Scaling, which is the focus of our discussion today in which he shares with us his journey leading to this book and really where he talks about how small teams can create huge growth and trying to take this topic that I mentioned before, applying the lessons learned from the games industry and from gaming to other areas. Thanks for joining us. Welcome, Ludovic. Thanks for having me, uh, Joseph. <laughs> So I thought I'd just start with like the the whole this thesis, right? Why do you think it is that gaming has lessons for other industries? And what kind of was the origin story behind your motivation to write this book? Yeah, absolutely. I mean the the origin story for for me actually starts around 2013. It was in, in January 2013, so at, at that time, so I, I own a video game uh, company, as you said, uh, we, we were doing like shooters and so on. We had studio, we have, we, are, we have studio in Asia, we have investor in Silicon Valley, and I'm traveling a, a lot uh, back and forth between Asia and Silicon Valley and doing a lot of uh, fundraising. And that particular day in, in January 2013, it's a, it's a Tuesday, and I'm in Finland, I'm in Helsinki. It's very cold. It's like 8.30 in the morning and I'm about to meet uh, one man uh, for the first time. Uh, we're having breakfast uh, downstairs of his building and this man is also the, the CEO of a video game company. He just launched his mobile game about six months ago and I'm, I know at that time already that he's on his way to be big, to be a billionaire also. And that, mine, that man uh, here on my, on my left is, is actually Hilka. Ilka Panamen, the, the CEO of, of Supercell. So Ilka is, is wearing his jeans, like with his black t-shirts with the Supercell logo on it. <laughs> and uh -huh. we exchange a, a few words and very quickly, even if it's the first time we, we meet, I feel very at ease with him and I start sharing with him how, how I feel. So I, I'm explaining to him that our game is growing and we're hiring a lot of people and we're raising funds, but I had one specific problem is like the more people I add to the team, the less productive I, I feel our team is, and also the more pressure I, I feel both on the financial okay. and, and just emotional. for our audience, Ludovic, you're saying predictive and not productive, right? Uh, pr productive, productive. Sorry. Oh, productive. Oh, productive. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Pr 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 predictive also. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, we can talk about that because I, I did read parts of the book. So yeah, but please yeah. go ahead. So the, the, the team is getting bigger and bigger and the, my problem is, is not getting sold basically. And mm. I mean, you, you're, you're an entrepreneur and part of the audience, if they are entrepreneur, they probably know, know the feeling like I feel like kind of running into a circle, just the bigger, bigger team, more and more financial pressure. But you know, my problem is not getting solved. And, I pause and I basically look at uh, Ilka and, and then Ilka say, why don't you stop hiring and instead focus on your existing team? And I, I pause and, and then why don't you stop hiring and instead focus on your existing team? And, and then he starts to explain to me Supercell. And he, he basically, you know, which is on, on his logo, on his, on his t-shirts. And he's basically right. saying that his team at Supercell, while developing game, are usually three to five people. And his objective is to keep the team as small as possible for as long right. as possible while growing successfully as much as, as possible. And that was very much kind of the first seed in, in my mind. 
And fast forward, when I became investor a few years later, I have to decide in which company and which team I want to invest. And I, I over the years, I saw, I see many more companies succeeding and I realized this importance of this uh, first principle, kind of stay, keep the team as small as possible for as long as possible. And this kind of became a, a mantra for, for me and ultimately culminated, culminated culminating into the, the creation of atomic, atomic scaling. So stay as small as possible for as long as possible that the atomic part while growing you know, financially as much as possible that the scaling part. Got and it. that's, that's kind of, that was the first seed and how I started working on atomic scaling. Oh, that's great to hear. And just for our audience, I have actually run the numbers on kind of revenue per employee for a number of gaming studios in the world. And Supercell is absolutely one of the highest in terms of revenue per employee. I mean, Ubisoft's kind of at the bottom, but they do an incredible job. And so it kind of sounds like what happened is that you have been talking to various game industry experts. You have a background in gaming yourself. And based upon those lessons learned, maybe they were kind of germinating inside of your head. And then when you shifted to to become an investor, you are trying to create a framework for yourself. And tell me if I'm right or wrong on this, but it sounds like you were creating this framework for yourself for how, how, how are you able to kind of create this kind of way of thinking about successful companies based upon your experiences with in the gaming industry and talking to these leading game industry experts? Is that Would that be fair to say, Ludovic? Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, Ilka planted this idea in my mind in 2018, but it kind of was in my mind and, and stayed there. When I start writing Atomic Scaling, I was at, at the beginning of COVID and I was basically already like a full-time investor and st- starting to do pretty well. I got indeed two unicorns uh, pretty uh, pretty quickly in my in my portfolio, which was which was nice. But actually, the idea of Atomic Scaling came from someone else and from actually okay. another gaming uh, gaming guy. And that's actually also a gaming entrepreneur who has around 350 employees. Mega hit game. He has a few very good game and one very big PC platform game. <laughs> yeah, and, and as you said, his, his company is actually the most profitable company per employee in USA in front of Apple and Google and Microsoft and so on. He's based in Seattle and yeah, yeah he's, he's okay. a bit of a legend in the gaming industry. He's a founder of Valve uh, with games like Counter-Strike and Dota and, and Steam, obviously. So that's uh, that game. So this game at the beginning of COVID kind of threw something at me that's kind of like, wow, it was a bit of, he basically said just this, like just a simple idea that the sets of lessons we learn in the video game business will be true of a much wider range of industry tomorrow. Uh, but no one yet has shared the, the lesson learned from the video game uh, business and how right. this can apply to a much wider range of, of industry. So it was kind of an epiphany for me. And I was at the beginning of my new life as an investor. I was looking to kind of formalize my investment thesis and it became my, my goal. So I wanted to make an impact and share the lessons we learn in the video game business not just for the people within the gaming industry, but also for the people outside of the, the gaming industry. Beginning of COVID, you know, everything was was going online. Gaming industry was doing great. Everyone right. started to kind of notice it because we were 100% online and other people suddenly had to had to shift. And yeah, that's 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 how it that's how it all happened. Got it. And I, I wanna say like I was actually going through the book and going through some of your endorsements. So <laughs> You are quite, I, I don't, I, I would have to say that the endorsements for this book are just incredible, right? And so from Peter Vesterbaca from Rovio, Ilka, uh, Kevin Lin, co-founder of Twitch, Gabe Newell, who you mentioned, there are like, so I could go on and on, but like the endorsements have been pretty crazy. How did you meet these guys? How did you build such an incredible network in the gaming industry and be able to speak to these guys to be able to learn? some of the insights that you have used in your book? Yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been in the gaming industry for, and it's the tech industry for a while and travel a lot. So Asia, where I'm based all for the time, I'm from Europe and 
right and and spend a lot of time in in usa or close to, to close to 10 years uh, i think like one of the reason why people are also excited about this is like people who want to share and everybody right. knows that the gaming industry is is doing extremely well and we we actually share between each other we i mean all, all everyone i think in the gaming industry is very generous but we kind of live in this bubble and i think with covid at least for me that was really like kind of this big shock like I had investment in gaming industry, I had investment outside of gaming industry. I knew right. my companies that are 100% focused online are going to do amazingly well, but I had also stress about the company where to suddenly go from 5% online to 10%, 20%, 100% online. So I think that's, that's, that's a reason like people want to share and want to share beyond the, 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 the gaming, the gaming industry. Right. And I hear that is something kind of specific to the Finnish gaming culture as well, right? Where they like to share a lot. And I know in your book, you do talk about kind of the difference between finite and infinite games, not so much from the perspective of zero sum versus infinite games, but in other aspects. But to this point, I do think that's one great thing about our industry is that there are so many people who aren't seeing each other so much as competition, but wanting to help each other and to help the industry grow. And I do think that Based upon some of the things that I, I saw in your book, I, I would highly recommend folks to check it out because there's certainly a lot of wisdom from a lot of the folks who you spoke to. And so I kind of understand how you kind of came about with the idea for the book and kind of the thesis behind it. But then what was your motivation as well to, to actually write the, is, is it to share with, with more people? folks broadly about, hey guys, this is the games in industry. This shouldn't be a secret. This can be applied to many other industries. What was the specific motivation to, to, to write the book? Yeah, the, 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 you're, 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 exactly, uh, you're exactly right. Like the, the, first, the first motivation was to, was to share this collective wisdom, not just with the people within the gaming industry, but with the people outside of, of the gaming industry. And uh, I wanted to also have this ability as an investor to read and to basically formalize my investment thesis. But as an entrepreneur, I also wanted to create this kind of navigation system where you basically have this like big principle from the gaming industry that make the gaming industry so, so successful today. And you try to kind of apply that to outside of, outside of the gaming industry, not just within the gaming industry, but also outside of the gaming industry. Certainly, if, if the book does well, it could help increase your reputation. We're living in a reputation-driven world at this point, or like the social media influence world. So maybe that would also help you with your investment businesses. Was that also a motivation? Yeah, it's, it's also, you know, it's also a way to kind of attract the right, uh, the right company that you want to, to, to partner. I mean, the, the more the companies are aligned with atomic scaling principle, the easier for me it is to, to give a go and and want to invest money and and network and support and time and so on to these to these companies right and so i think the the kind of crux of the the book or that the, the kind of framework that you're describing is what you call the three p's three r's framework yep. people prediction playbook revenue yep. reach retention and i thought maybe we could right. just kind of briefly i mean i i, I think I, again, I would highly recommend the audience to to get the book and to check it out on their own. But just to give the audience kind of like an, a high level understanding of the topics that you cover, could could we walk through the three P's, three R's, and then and then how did maybe you could even give us a little bit of backstory behind how you came to this specific framework of three P's and three R's? Yeah, absolutely. So the the, the people part, you know, start with this first principle, which is to keep the team as small as possible for as long as possible. That's really like, like the, 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 the atomic part of it. And within, within this, within this first principle, like I basically deconstruct, like, how do you actually create small team that are extremely capable and have extraordinary output. And around that, there is multiple ideas that uh, we go we go through that I'm not going to go into uh, into details um, uh, before. But we talk, for example, about this ability to go from left brain to right brain, this ability to create this magical pair, and all the all the trust uh, aspects behind behind the team and so on. 
But may maybe before I address this, like, because there is a bit of an elephant in the room when I talk to people about atomic scaling, is if we want to keep the team as small as possible for as long as possible, like, what does it mean for the employees of the companies who are actually going to ac adopt uh, atomic scaling? A, a lot of them by default are like, oh, okay, that means we're going to start like firing people and having less and less people. That means we're not going to hire people, et cetera, et cetera. So the uh, kind of the elephant in uh, in the room uh, here is like we we're, we're not there is there is the old way of uh, of scaling and the old way of scaling is like you you grow and you just hire more and more people and you become bigger and bigger and bigger. I've personally seen time and time again the uh, the damage to companies and friends running this this company and some of them with quite a dramatic outcome. And when the uh, when the bubble burst and it always does, the, the, the fall is extremely uh, painful and, and dangerous. On the other end, you have like all this traditional company, like I, I call them kind of the fat company that the one with maybe big revenue, big workforce, and maybe even pretty good profit. And this company today clearly at risk of, of, of disruption mm -hmm. from company who are adopting AI, adopting the atomic scaling principle and so on. Here with atomic scaling, we're not trying to kind of, it's not like a job killer. It's like the idea of we, it's more about having, instead of a large team working on one project, it's a, it's about having multiple small team, like cells, work like cells in organism, working on smaller and smaller and more and more focused projects. So from there, like we basically want to give more ownership to employees, but also more benefits to, to the employees. The, we're encouraging to feel more empowered, to have greater trust between the people, to work better together, and also to reward financially much greatly than the traditional, the traditional model. Yeah. And, and I, I did read that part of the book, which I thought was great. And again, I would highly recommend the audience to get the book and to read some of those concepts there. But maybe I could also push back a little bit or ask for a clarification because the, the general themes that you talk about in terms of empowerment, you talk about like the supercell notion of a reverse pyramid in, in the book, for example. Yeah. And, and I, I actually think that it's quite fair some of the notions you talk about in, ter in terms of like sharing some of the, the, the outcomes of, of employees that actually deliver better results. But I also think in some cases there are, for example, so Steve Jobs was famous for a quote in which he mentioned that the best employees don't need to be managed. And I, I, I believe that to be true, that there are certain employees, the people part, where you have people who are really great, who are overachievers. Steve Jobs talked about Waz being a 30X engineer, but that's not necessarily the mindset of all people, right? And so there may be people in a company who don't have that mindset. And for example, I started a company in India and just for our audience, uh, Ludovic's an investor in, in my company as well, but like the historical context in India has been a services oriented company. Tell me the job, I do the job, I finish the job, I go home. And so in that context, do you think it's, is it only certain companies with those kinds of people, like the Steve Jobs kind of people who can, who can take advantage of some of these principles? Or how, do you, how would you create an organization to get those kinds of people who can move the needle in that way? to empower those people because some people, even if you empower them, they're going to be, they're basically going to be like, well, I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. And then once they do their job, they're going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to go home. I don't know what else. Like that mindset has not been taught to them, for example, and just wondering how you think about situations like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the first thing is to look at the size of the team. Like if with that atomic scaling, we're trying to keep team that are like pizza, pizza size type of type of team, like a small team, like three, five, seven people, like a type. Right. So if the team is much smaller, you basically suddenly start to see a lot more who is doing what, basically. That that's the, right. that's There's the a lot more transparency. The flaws yeah. become very visible at that point. I the, see what you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. The, the second point is we focus on a magical pair. So if you have a small team, but if you don't have a magical pair on leading the team, 
there is a good chance that the team is not as performant as, as it could be. And magical pair within the magical pair, you have like this, this leadership happening. So you don't necessarily have one boss out of the two, but you have this two people constituting the magical pair that basically become somehow the, the management force or the leadership force of the company, not necessarily playing the boss, but they're actually driving the, the direction. So if, if first step you, the team, instead of being a big team, meaning more than seven or eight people. If it's a smaller team, like three, five, seven people, suddenly it's a lot easier to manage. And second thing, if you actually have a magical pair leading that, suddenly there is actually leadership. There is some kind of, of, of management. Right. And I think the next P, we, we mentioned prediction versus production. I, I think I was kind of preempting you because I, I did look through, through your book, but could you talk about what you mean by prediction? Yeah, pr prediction, like we, we, we're talking about this idea of PVP. So not player versus player, but prediction versus, versus prophecy. So yeah. pr prediction is something that you actually, you, you have a set of hypotheses and you actually measure. You measure your set of hypotheses. You see basically the, your hypothesis versus reality. Like Zynga probably is one of the company who kind of brought this to the gaming right. industry at, at the level where we are, where we are right now. Like this ability to constantly have hypotheses and constantly look at your hypothesis and measure versus what's happening right now as you are developing developing the game as you are actually running the games in live ops and and so on. So the first thing that we look at on on the prediction path, we also have like four principles within that, is actually how you actually bring you give back the the power of prediction to the people. Like if you go to most company like gaming company and traditional company like non-gaming company most people don't know how to predict most people have not been taught how to predict so you don't you don't really learn how to predict at school or at universities and so on it's right. not something like it's not something that we've been we've been taught so the first thing is like okay everyone here has the capability to make prediction we encourage everyone to make prediction and we're going to teach people how to make a prediction uh, within the prediction uh, part, we actually go through uh, Twitch, who has been really famous uh, within the industry to empower the people to uh, to make more prediction and also using like mathematical kind of uh, prediction and teaching people how to predict. And since they got bought by Amazon, uh, this also kind of, you know, really match well the, the culture of uh, Amazon. Then once we actually agree on the fact that we should bring back the power of prediction to people and we, st we should start teaching to people, we also teach people not only to predict, but how to differentiate prediction versus prophecy. Prophecy is typically what happens in a meeting where people start to say, okay, we should increase by, you know, 20% of revenue, or we should increase by 5% or activation rates, or we should do this, or we should do that. And there is not no measurement there and people tend to just follow who has a louder voice in the in the meeting so prophecy is not a bad thing it's actually necessary as you come up with hypotheses you look at gut feeling you look at benchmark and stuff like that but you need to start to be able to differentiate the pvp the prediction versus the prophecy and start shifting prophecy toward toward prediction and you do that and we go through how Gabe or so Valve uh, recommends this this cycle you go through the cycle of hypothesis measurement and change and the faster you are at this the the better the more productive your your company uh, become G Gabe has actually a code that I really like that I use quite a lot in in my workshops and in in this in this chapter he, he said predictions matter as much as production. So prediction matter as much as production. The ability to predict, to make proper hypothesis, measure, change quickly, and, and basically have your hypothesis match in reality as quickly as, as possible is actually more powerful than the production capability. And I also take example of a traditional company like LVMH, like the, the French luxury company. Right. Everybody thinks LVMH is really good on the, on the right part of the brain, you know, like the creative part and so on, which is true. They have very good designers and they, they bought a very expensive company with very good designers and so on. But actually the core 
of uh, LVMH and uh, the core of Bernard Arnault, who is actually an engineer uh, from the, the top uh, engineering school from France, uh, Polytechnic. The core of Bernard Arnault, a little bit like Jeff Bezos, is his capability to make uh, prediction and to have all his subsidiaries, because it's actually all fairly small team within the LVMH uh, group, uh, being really good at prediction. And the result of that is they have almost zero waste. If they produce a, a luxury bag, the luxury bag gets sold and they don't do discount and they don't do this because okay. they're really, really good at knowing what they should produce based on their capability to, to, to predict. And so, when, when it comes to prediction, how, how wide or how broad is the scope of prediction that you would recommend for a company? So for example, Zynga is famous for expected outcomes, which is largely product driven, right? So we introduce this feature, we think this change will have this impact. And so from a product perspective, I, I, I can totally see it absolutely makes sense. You should be trying to predict those kinds of things related to product production, of number of handbags that we're going to sell, things like that. But then internally, and not necessarily product or manufacturing oriented, do you also apply predictions within the organization and the company itself? Or would you just apply mainly to like product outcomes, for example? Yeah, some of the example we take with, with Twitch, for example, and that's while we're writing the book, we're also running workshop to with gaming and non-gaming company to test the materials and so on. And one thing that really resonates with, with a, lot of, a lot of companies is how to apply prediction also to your production capability. For example, if you're developing a software, encouraging your engineers to come up with prediction on how many days it's going to take to develop this or that features. And once you actually ask this, ask them like what percentage chance do you think it's going to, if the engineer say, oh, I think it's going to take three days to develop this feature, then ask the question, what percentage chance do you think it's actually going to be complete within three days? Well, and that's actually some of the example we take with, with Twitch. Well, maybe 60%. Okay, so that's 60%. That's not a 100%, that's not an 80%. So why 60%? And then you actually go back through a back and forth and you realize that maybe it's not a three days uh, prediction, but maybe it's actually a four days or five days. And it's much better to have this conversation early on and have high confidence that this will happen within five days, for example, rather than just get the answer from the engineer. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it because the boss said we should do it quickly. So encouraging people to have this conversation back and forth, put mathematical hypothesis like 80% chance and so on to kind of have this back and forth conversation is something that Twitch encouraged and got really good at and Valve and other companies. Yeah. And, we... and I know like for, for engineers, like doing time estimates for engineering tasks is something that's controversial. Some, some like it, some don't, but I, I, I think yeah. that to your point, at least if you start having a conversation about why, why three hours versus five hours or half a day versus a full day or whatever, then you can start to think more critically about it. And I can certainly see that, for example, it could be applied to other kinds of disciplines and processes, right? So for example, you might have a certain HR or recruitment process, or you have by adding a written test or changing who the interviewer is, what do we think the, the, the probability of making a successful hire or a, or a high performing hire is, or things like that. I can see that being potentially applied to many other areas, but I, I'm just not having done that practice in terms of trying to predict those things. I do think that it's worth reading the cases in your book where it has been applied and understanding how it has been successfully applied by companies like Zynga in at least from a product perspective and to try and at least think about where else can we apply these kinds of pr principles of prediction to help benefit the company in some ways. Yeah. And, and we also took the example of Voodoo, the upper casual uh, game developer. Like okay. one, of, one of the things that I think one of the big revolution that happened fairly recently with the hyper casual game was the fact that we could test an idea by running Facebook ads very, right. very quickly before actually really investing in making, making the games. And I think it applied to, to many things. Like when, 
when I wrote the book, for example, like I needed to take, take a while to write a book, like seven, seven different manuscripts, editor, publisher, you know, a lot of back and forth and so on. Did, did you predict on, how long it would take you? <laughs> well, I, I had a very bad prediction. <laughs> that was more prophecy back, back then. Yeah. yeah. And one of the reasons is I, I, it's actually my third book, but it's actually the first book that will past the finish line and being being fully published the, the book okay. is actually going out uh, next month it, it's going it's going out actually for for gdc so uh, in march yeah so one of one of the way to reduce also the the risk is as you're actually writing the book or as you're developing the game well you have beta testers that means you actually test your content with other writers mm -hmm. with companies gaming non-gaming and you kind of and the content change a lot by doing that right so I guess one of the other aspects of prediction that you're promoting is this notion of like testing and iterating very, very rapidly. Yeah, that's uh, the, the, the quicker you do it, the, the, the better. Yeah. I mean, especially in gaming industry, it's, it's been a little bit better in the last few years, but it's so easy and I've done it multiple times as a, as a game entrepreneur, like it's so easy to have an idea and think this idea is going to be the best and Absolutely. you start working on it and suddenly you enter the tunnel and you think it's going to take six months and two years later, you're still working on it. And it's, Tell and you're that. like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been there, done that and yeah. <laughs> lost, lost air in, in <laughs> Yeah, no, that's so yeah, the, the quicker, the quicker you do that, the, the better. And, and I, I, I actually invested in a few uh, fintech company and some of my favorite investments where I spent quite a bit of time with is actually algo trading company. And I just mm -hmm. love algo trading company because they come up with an idea and within days they have the ID tested and, and if it works, well, you start printing money basically and you can see on in real time your hypothesis versus reality which is the reality actually are the trade the hypothesis is your win rate and 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 so on and and this is this is beautiful like if you have almost no intermediary between your assumption and, and the market right and the third p is playbook yeah, playbook. We talk a lot about about alignment, and we talk about play to win, and we talk about like different different things. But maybe it's kind of to kind of share like the 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 idea of of playbook. I'm going to maybe like just share a story that maybe illustrate illustrate mm -hmm. illustrate this. Please. The idea of of playbook and and alignment. So I was actually not that long ago. I was at the I was at the park with with my daughter with with Mia and with my oldest daughter. And we, we basically meet to meet a friend and very quickly I, I told them, Hey guys, like, why, why don't you start playing the, playing with the ball? So I, th I throw them the ball and they start, uh, they start playing. So you have one kid who is like kicking as hard as possible, uh, the ball, another one who grabbed the ball with the hand and start chasing the other and throwing and trying to tag the other kid. And very quickly, everyone is exhausted and boom, suddenly you got one kid who got hit in the face and game over, like a uh, kid start to cry. And it's, uh, so I, I go and I, I basically look at the damage I look at the kid and, and, and then I realized, oh yeah. So I told the, I told the kids, Hey, why don't we actually play soccer? A few of us are actually French, so it's easy. We know <laughs> the rules. We create two teams and there is one team with one player short, so I end up playing as a, as a goalie, as a, as a goalkeeper. And we know we play for two hours and it's a lot of fun. Everybody enjoys it and no more injuries. And the, the epiphany for me after the, the kid got hit in, hit in the face is I actually realized that they were playing the infinite game. We, we talk a little bit about infinite game versus uh, finite game. So in, in gaming, infinite games are basically game with no common rules so literally the game can change every time and every time there is a new player joining well the rules change and nobody really know the rules and the probably the most famous infinite game out there is actually business that's like a, it's exciting but at the same time human are not designed for infinite game we are made for finite games and in, in fact, actually, as a gaming company, as a game designer, that's pretty much what we do all day. We, we design rules to play, to turn an infinite game into, into a finite games. 
So as as a player, you know, the first thing as a gamer you you do when you start playing a game is to try to understand the rules of the game. So then you know how to win. And if it's a team game, you start to see, okay, how each teammate will actually play a specific role and how you will win the game. But then think of business and think of your business. Like, are you, are you playing, are you playing a finite or infinite uh, game? And specifically, like, you know, do, do you know what it takes? Do you and do your teammates know what it takes to win in your, in your business? And if you're playing as, as a as a team, do you know? Do each of your teammates know their role in how we're going to to win? And if you if you wake up in the morning, like you know, do you know what's going to be uh, the your role at at winning at winning today? And and myself and many many people around me, like if you if you're exhausted at the end of the day and you feel like you walk 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 a lot, but then you achieved uh, nothing. That's probably because you actually play in this infinite game. And if you, you know, you might be confused about the rules and what you're trying to achieve and, and so on. And, and as a leader, if I feel like this, that means most likely the people working with me probably feel even more like this. Another sign of playing the infinite game is if, if you have a lot of traffic controls meeting. What I call a traffic control meeting is typically when a team member comes to you and ask with, for approval. You know, is we have this uh, three A things, you know, uh, additional clarification, approval or appraisal. So if a manager all day long, and I've done that as an entrepreneur many, many times, and it's pretty painful. And that's, that's why also I want other people to not have this pain as much as I had in the, in the past. If you play the traffic light meeting guy, that means if all day long, you're like, okay, green, you can do it, you know, orange, maybe not red. No, you don't do it. If you do that a lot all day long, but that's probably a sign that you are actually playing an infinite game and that your team actually need more understanding of what is actually their game. So the, the way that you're talking about a finite versus an infinite game is really along the lines of understanding the rules or the bounds of the game and the importance to find alignment. So it's a little, it's less the sort of Simon Sinek, James Cars version of finite versus infinite games. But I see what you're saying though, in, in terms of knowing how to win and aligning the team is, is kind of what you're saying is important in this case. Yeah, and the and the, the playbook you have the the original playbook you know which come come with like your your vision and your value and your and your why you know why we're doing mm -hmm. this why why we created this company originally, right? And that's something that actually as an investor I remember for example with uh, Lila Games that you you have done extremely well. I was very impressed uh, when when you know when you've done that at the at the very start. But then as you as as the game you know there is like maybe like five stage in the game game development. You know, from the game idea, the formation of the team, the yep. game development, the launch of the game and the live ops. Like while you, while the original playbook is the same, the culture, the value, the why and so on, every time you actually transition from one stage to another, your playbook needs to be adjusted to realign the team. And usually there is also like realignment of the team uh, necessary. There's a lot of other lessons from your book I need to, to take into Lila as well, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> But the, 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 this idea of playbook, actually, this, even this word that of this word playbook, it's, it's a kind of a US, a US word, you know, it was actually introduced to me the first time by Nicolas Laurent, the, uh, who was back then the CEO of Riot Games, League of Legends. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that, that's, he, he was basically the one planting this seed of, of playbook and Riot up to this day as has been very, very good at playing the game with a strong, strong playbook. Right. All right. And maybe, maybe just more briefly, there's that's, that's half the book and then the other half is revenue, reach, retention, but maybe we could just briefly cover some of those in terms of what you mean by each of those concepts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So start, starting with the revenue, like if you look at the game industry, like mo most of the game industry right now in terms of revenue is coming from the free to play. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of lessons from the game industry and from specifically how to optimize the freemium model. 
and how to apply the the free the free model to to other industry so part of the revenue uh, chapter we have a big focus on how to i call it the uh, ikigai of uh, of free how to actually optimize as you're designing the product how how to optimize your 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 free your free your free model through the through the reach reach is something that you know it's every company in every industry wants to have more how do you reach more more customers more more users and so on we go through a model that i call ob ob is for own buy and earn so own is like your own list like how you actually develop uh, your own list earn is buy is obviously through you know buy advertising and so on through a through a different way and earn is like earn your way in for example Right now, I'm earning my way in into your audience through a podcast. That's like right. the, the earn part. So we go through each of it and uh, each of the OBE, OB, and we explain how gaming company do it and how this can be used better, more within the game industry and outside of the game industry. And within the, within the retention, well, retention is a lot of focus is on live ops. And that's what I call like the best kept secret in the, from, from the gaming industry. Um, live ops is majority of the revenue, like 58%, but uh, of the revenue of gaming industry is coming from live ops, but certain company like EA and so on, like it's more like 70 ish percent of the revenue is actually coming from live ops. So uh, I develop, everybody talks about live ops within the gaming industry, but uh, I think it's still lacking a little bit of a common understanding. We talk about playbook. Part of the playbook is also to have common language, common words. So okay. I created in the, in the, in the retention part, I created a framework that I call the love framework that basically introduce to the gaming industry people an acronym and outside of the gaming industry people, what is, what is live ops and live ops with a love framework. We're talking about live, L, the L is for live product development. The yep. O is for organized event calendar. The V is for very special sales and offer. <laughs> and, and the E is for engagement and uh, re-engagement. Mm -hmm. Things like churn, churn prevention, churn detection, where a company like Kabam, for example, we talk about in the, in the game are really good at. And for, for each, we take example. For example, at Smilegate in the shooter industry, the top performing shooter Fire, talk about yep. Smilegate, yeah, Crossfire and how they, they've done it. And yeah, and for, for each of that, we, we go, we go through it. So th this, that's also one of the objective for me for the gaming industry is within the gaming industry, we have, we have designers, we have producer, we have artists, we have ga a game developer, networking engineers, et cetera, et cetera. If we start to all have a common understanding of what it takes to actually build this, not just as a game, but as a business, if we start to have common language, then the meeting, the brainstorming, the discussion is a lot easier because yeah, right. okay. I understand why we're doing this because we're doing live ops, live ops through the love framework is, and we want this because we have this organized event calendar that is a big part of what we're doing. So um, that's this collective wisdom that you mentioned and the endorsement for, that I got that I, it, it's also because we want to kind of crystallize this uh, collective wisdom that maybe was shared between the CEOs and at GDC and around drinks and beers and Slack groups and so on. <laughs> and we want to make this, this knowledge available to everyone. So we all have a common understanding of the game. We all have a common language, common wording, common rules, and we play the game better together. That's great, Ludovic. Uh, and I, I definitely, personally, I haven't finished reading all of the book, but I have read some, some part, a lot of parts of it and I did quite enjoy it. So I totally understand why you got the endorsements that you did, but it sounds like what one of your objectives is, is it besides the things that we talked about is kind of this, this notion about creating a common framework. But if you were to think about the, the one thing you would love for someone in the audience to take away from reading your book, what, what would that be? What would it be this common language or kind of the, just a, applying the lessons learned or what would, what would mean success for you for, for a reader to have read your book and, and to have taken something away from it? 
You know, I think as a, as an entrepreneur or as as anyone working on and being very passionate about about making games, like having this a little bit more peace at the end of the day when you go to bed and when you wake up in the morning and so on. I, I think if if atomic scaling can bring some of that to to the people by bringing them this navigation system. If you feel stressed about everything, well, you can start looking at the 3P, 3R, the navigation system, and you can start seeing, okay, where I maybe need to improve a little bit. And if I improve a little bit here, suddenly, oh, everything feels much better already. And part of the things we do is if you go to atomicscaling.com, we have a quiz where we basically just in a few questions, we identify like what kind of leadership profile you are. And based on that, we say, okay, this is your strengths and this is your profile and this is your strengths green. And this is maybe on, on the, on the right side, like, you know, a little bit more red, like this is your, your things where you're not naturally good at. And based on that, if you are, your strengths, if your strengths are, let's say aligned with like the profile called, we call the dreamer then you will be very good at uh, playbook, for example. And then how yeah. can you be even better at playbook? I see. Okay. And if you are maybe not that good at, for example, at uh, prediction, okay, you know, it's not your profile, etc. You know, that's your, your weakness. So how can you be slightly better at that? Maybe by having someone in your team who become kind of the, the guy like really, really, really pushing for it or also by you paying attention to it. So I think at the, at, at the end of the day, having this navigation system or this operating system or this navigation system that brings a little bit, not just scaling and wealth and so on, but also a little bit more peace at the end of the day when, you know, when you go to bed or, or when you wake up in the morning. Right. It's kind of like what you're talking about, self-awareness, right? So if you are suggesting that a lot of these lessons from the games industry can be applied to achieve success in many different disciplines and industries. And then based upon this collection of lessons or skills to have this self-awareness about what you are good at. And then if you were to build, put a team together, what else you would need in order to achieve success? Yep, exactly. Great. And I, I will say Ludovic that I think this is a very interesting book. I highly recommend people check it out. But the book I would also recommend that you write next is How to Be a Master Networker. Because again, I, I, I'm telling the audience, you got you to gotta see who has endorsed Ludovic's book here. And then some of your blog posts or Instagram, I'm seeing you with all these famous people like Manuel Macron and all these other guys. I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> Ludovic knows everybody. But uh, anyway, I uh, just, just want to compliment you on your masterful networking and relationship skills, Ludovic. Thank you. And thank you for having me today. I, okay. It was fun. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And for our audience, hope you enjoy the book and we will catch you next time. Thanks again, Ludovic. <laughs>